Joshua chapter 5, and starting in verse number 1. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites which were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over there, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of foreskins. And this is the, and this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. And all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. The children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord swear that he would not show them the land which the Lord swear unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children whom the, he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done the circumcising all the people, uh, that they abode in their place in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal, unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at eve in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat all the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Let's look for the Lord Dear Jesus, Thank you for our time you've given to us this morning. Lord, I pray you made me a vessel that would bring a great message to these dear folks this morning, a message of stepping out. Lord, I pray you encourage us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Reaching for the promised land involves steps. This passage finds the children of Israel having crossed the Jordan River to Canaan. Pretty amazing. The, the, they had left Egypt for 40 years ago, plus now they were there. And they had seen the Lord do some pretty amazing things. He delivered them from bondage in the land of Egypt. Many miracles, signs and wonders. He had led them through a harsh wilderness. And they saw him bless and move in marvelous ways. He fed them manna and gave them quail to eat. Not once, not twice, but for 40 years. I just thought about that. I was reading it. I've read that passage this week. 40 years they had manna. You know, go get the manna. Okay, go get the manna. Okay, you know, for years. They protect, the Lord had protected them from enemies. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, my clothes wear out a lot faster than 40 years. Well, theirs did. The Lord miraculously maintained it. He gave them the law to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. He did all kinds of things. The Lord was the people, Israel was the people of the Lord, the people of the law, and now they're becoming the people of the land. They're going to enter their land, the great promise God had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now they're going to realize it. It was going to be theirs. The days of wandering are over. Aren't you glad when you're wandering for a while, when it's over? Uh, I know sometimes I've gotten lost. Uh, imagine that, man, a minute he gets lost, right? I got lost driving places, and I'm like, oh, I'm no longer lost. I'm no longer wandering. Uh, I can remember driving with my aunt and my cousin, and uh, we got lost in Vermont, driving all around. And when we finally found the right road, it was like, oh, we're on the right track again. No longer are they wandering. Now they're on the right path. They're in the land that they're supposed to own and God intended for them to have. And there were some preparations they needed to make before they really started taking the land. They were stepping in. Now there's some steps that God wanted them to make to get everything ready for them to occupy and possess that land. And just as God challenged Israel to prepare to move deeper into the promised land, there's some steps that he would have us to make as well. If we're going to go deeper with our Lord, if we're going to have that victorious Christian life, if we're going to reach that promised land, if we really want the Lord, uh, have the, if we really want what the Lord has for us, we have to make some preparations. 
there's some steps that we need to make. And first of all, we must make a step of consecration. A step of consecration. The first commandment the Lord gave Israel when they moved into the land of promise was circumcised. To circumcise the men. And this had been handed down to, at Abraham and ever since. It was a physical sign used to identify all the male descendants of Abraham. All the men that were born in Egypt had been circumcised according to the Abrahamic covenant. But those who had wandered around 40 years in the wilderness had not been. And God said that needs to be done. And before this generation of men could claim Canaan, enjoy the covenant promises of God, and expect God to fight their battles, they, they must take this step. They must renew the covenant. This was important with the Lord. If they wanted to see the blessings on them and guarantee the victory, they had to do this. Just as Israel was required to remove from their bodies a piece of flesh as a sign they were a part of the covenant, we must remove some things from our lives. We're not talking about flesh, but remove things from our lives to show that we are totally surrendered to the Lord. That we're His. The Bible is clear in many portions that there, we have to engage, if you want to use the word spiritual surgery, to remove things from our lives that ought not to be there. As believers, let me read you a passage in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection, affections on things above, not on things of earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is all our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, and inordinate infection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, into which ye also walked sometimes when ye lived in them, but now ye also must put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blaspheme, filthy communication out of your mouth. Hey, that's quite a list. And that's not the only list you'll find in the Bible that we need to cast off. If it does not, this is a good statement, I read this this week, if it does not glorify God, does not edify the church or help you grow in the Lord, get rid of it. The, the, the premier thing is does it edify God? Does it edify God what you're doing? Uh, to, to the Jew, the circumcision was a reminder that they were a marked people. They were never to forget that they were servants of the living God. And they were under the obligation to obey him in all things. Circumcision was to be an outward reminder of an inward work. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, Circumcise, uh, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Hey, we need, we need to take care of things in our hearts. Uh, in Colossians 2, 11 says, We have been circumcised in the heart, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Our old nature uh, has, has been judged and, uh, judged and condemned by God, and as believers, we need to be living the new life, amen? We need to be living a way that is contrary to the world. So that indicates consecration. We are consecrated to the Lord. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the loss thereof. The internal work of salvation in our lives will show an outward work of sanctification. Our works will indicate our heart. Now, I'm sure you've met individuals who say they're Christians but live like the world. Or if you want to use the word, the term that we often use, live like the devil. Right? We, we know people like that. And that's not the way we're supposed to live. When we're, when we're saved, we're supposed to live like we're saved, amen? We have a new life. It's not like the old life. And anything that displeases the Lord needs to be cut off. It needs to be removed. It needs to be cut off and put away from you forever. Maybe there's some things in your, in your life today that are not allowing you to live the Christian life that the Lord has saved you to live. You know, He's saved you to live a Christian life that's honoring and glorifying to Him. He didn't save you so you could live in the gutter. He didn't save you so you could live like the world. He saved you so you could live and glorify Him. We need to come today, if we're in that situation where we got things holding us back in our Christian life, we need to come and get renewed today and get things right with the Lord and get back on track and serve Him. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's times in your life when things have come up and you made promises to God that you will do this if you'll bring you through. I don't want any hands raised, but I'm sure it happens. Hey, you better fulfill those promises. You promise to do it just because you're in a good spot and eat now doesn't mean you don't have an obligation to do it. You promised. You need to do it. 
Don't you think it's time that you live like who you claim to be? You say, oh, pastor, I am. Well, that's good. Praise the Lord. But sometimes we falter. Sometimes we get things mixed up. Hey, let's, let's show off the new creature. Let's show off how the Lord has saved us. Let's show what the world what it's all about. Remove any, any uh, smears or smacks of worldliness in our lives. Get rid of it. And show that genuine devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be sure that our lives are as clean as they can so we be candidates of His power and His, and his glory in the sense of bringing honor and glory to Him. But we need to be concentrated. We, concentrated. we need to do that. We see that in verses 1 to 7. I just read those verses. I won't read them again, but that's what we see. And then we see in verse number 8, we must take the step of confirmation. And it came to pass when they had done the circumcising all the people, and they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Israel had left the other side of the Jordan River and the west side and went into the east side into the land of Canaan, which really was the land of enemies right now. The enemies were still there. So they moved in and then within days of getting there, all the men were circumcised. So they were unable to fight any battles. They had to recover from this and they were totally dependent upon God to defend them. It was a staff of confirmation that Consecration, now we're confirming this is the Lord's hand doing this. It's of the Lord. Their obedience to the Lord's command for them was a supreme act of faith. Don't think for a moment that those enemies didn't wish to destroy them. They had to be willing to trust the Lord to protect them until they are healed. And while they waited, they were vulnerable to attack. Their faith was the secret to the success and their safety. These men had learned <clears throat> through valuable lessons in life that if they were going to win victory, if they were going to have a physical battle and win physically, the Lord had to be on their side or they would lose. They could come up with all kinds of battlefield tactics. They could come up with the best weaponry. But if God was not on their side, they would not see victory. And they said, we are going to trust God. Even in the land of the enemies, God is capable of protecting us. Hey, this is a time of testing to confirm their faith. God says, do it. They're like, yes, sir, we'll do it. And we'll trust you to take care of us. As we move through life, we often face this time of testing, don't we? As we move through life, we face time of testing. When times of testing come, there's a lot of things we can rely on. There, there's nothing bad about relying upon family to help out or friends, uh, the church, whatever. There's all kinds of things. But they will never really get lasting victory in our lives until we come to a place where we rely upon our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing wrong when you're having a bad day to tell a friend, but make sure you tell the Lord first. You know, you bring it to Him. He cares. He loves you. We, we see through God's Word what He's done for you. The, the people of Israel have come through a great victory. And you know what happens after a great victory often? Is, look how good I am. Pride. Ah, great victory often brings pride. Rises up in us. And we think that we're unstoppable. Not if you're a uh, Toronto Maple Leafs fan. That, that's definitely not us, right? When those times come in our lives, though, we need to remember that God has brought us through that. And that often after those great moments of victory, the Lord brings us through times of testing. God wants us to learn the vital truth that nothing in this life is really about us. It's all about Him. It's about Him. It's about Him. It's good, but it's not enough just to be cleansed spiritually, making sure that our hearts are right with the Lord. We must be walking in faith before the Lord. Walking in faith. We remember that our God can and will take care of His children. The people of Israel didn't realize it, but God had used a miracle at Jordan to strike at the fear, uh, strike fear in the hearts of the enemy. The enemy found out what happened to Jordan, and they all took off home because they were scared. Now, it's, it, you know, I try to imagine in my mind's eye what that must have looked like to see the waters push back and see all Israel. And I'm not talking about the Red Sea, I'm talking about the Jordan River. And as they all walked across that Jordan River, I don't know if the enemies were close enough to see the, the waters push back, but they did find out that Israel was there and that they didn't swim. They walked across on dry ground. If I was a man in the military fighting against these guys, I think I would resign my commission and run for the hills. Because there's no way that I could fight against a God who could push the waters back. 
I'm incapable of facing that. And God is more than able to sustain us. You know what we have? We read God's word and uh, we say, well, that was good for Israel. Well, you know what? The God of Israel still lives today. He's your God. So the God of Israel who pushed back the Jordan River is still alive today. The, the God who sustained Noah and his family through the worldwide flood is still alive today. The Lord who took care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace is still alive today. The God who took care of Elijah by the brook with the ravens and then by the, the widow of uh, Zarephath, he's still alive today. And we can look at Paul and we see how he was attacked and, and stoned and beaten and left for dead. And that God who took care of Paul is still alive today. He's your God. He's my God. He's still alive. He still cares. He's still watching out for us. His power has not withered. We, we, I believe so much today in Christianity we get fooled by the world's philosophy and its teachings that we think our God, He might be God, but He's not powerful enough. He is! He's all powerful. He has not changed. If He wanted to, He could roll back the oceans and we could walk across if He wanted to. He's all powerful. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? The answer is no. Nothing is too hard for him. Can you honestly say that you're completely relying on the Lord in every trial you face? And the reality is, most of us would have to say no. We're not. But we need to be. We need to be trusting him completely. He can take care of us. Are we walking by faith? I was thinking about that this week. One of my prayers in my life is that I will show my family, my children, and this church that I'm walking by faith. I think God honors walking by faith, amen. And I want to, de to demonstrate that. I want to see God do great things. But so often, walking by faith is not real comfortable, is it? Because we don't know what's going to happen. It's not a real exciting place. Well, it's exciting because you don't know what's going to happen. But we don't like that excitement most days. We just like everything to be the same. When we face those times of confirmation in our lives, when we exercise absolute faith in the power of God to handle those situations, it confirms our faith in His person, His power, and His purposes in our lives. Our God's all-powerful. He has not changed. We must take a step of consecration, we must take a step of confirmation, and we must take the step of contemplation. Just think about here in verse number 9. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. The term reproach of Israel, or sorry, let's say it's Egypt, not Israel. The reproach of Egypt brings to mind two things. First, it refers to the fact that males who came out of Egypt were not circumcised. Hence, they had to take care of this before they could go into battle. And the second event uh, during Israel's wanderings would take place in Exodus chapter 32 when uh, Israel made that golden calf. Remember, uh, Aaron said they threw in the gold and they came out like a golden calf. Man, that's one of the lamest things I've ever heard in my life. I threw in the gold and it came out as a calf. You know, that, that was a reproach. That was appropriate. It was wrong. And they showed great disbelief and, and, uh, uh, and refused as well to enter into the land of promise in Numbers chapter 14. The reproach of Egypt refers to the sins the people brought with them in their hearts and lives when they left, when they came out of Egypt. On both occasions, the Lord threatened to destroy the nation of Israel and start fresh with Moses. And both times Moses interceded for Israel and reminded the Lord that destroying Israel would give the Egyptians a reason to mock God and that they brought him out for a reason. And Well, here he's, we're told that he, them, that he rolls away that reproach. Gilgal means rolling. In other words, their past is no longer an issue. It had been forever rolled away. This was a new day. It's, it's rolled away. The children of Israel were contemplating the work of God in their lives and removing from them the reproach of the past. Many children of God's children are still living on the reproach of Egypt. You may be living with the shame of things you've done in the past before you came to faith in Christ. Maybe you're ashamed of things you've done and that you've failed the Lord since you've been saved. There may be guilt over some things that are still in our life and you haven't got right yet present issues. Some of people, some Christians I know today are 
seem to be living under a constant uh, stab of self-condemnation. Let me remind you today, if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, your past is no longer an issue. It's gone. It's gone. It is gone. The reproach of the old life has been removed forever. You must get past the guilt of those days before you can walk in victory to Canaan land. Take the time to contemplate that. Think about it. Many Christians have failed. Listen, all Christians have failed the Lord. No one's got it all right. Everyone's failed. Everyone's made mistakes. Oh, some may be small in our eyes. You know, in God's eyes, all sin is sin. You know, we think, oh, this one is so big. No, no don't. It's unwise to compare ourselves among ourselves. You know, look to the Lord. And sure, we failed. And some have results. Some Christians I know think are think this way, that they're, they're defeated and they, they, they live like second-class second citizens in the kingdom of God. My friend, if you've confessed your sin and repented of it, it's been taken care of forever and God will never bring it back up again. It's gone. As far as the east from the west. It's rolled away. Hey, remember, have you ever sang that song? I sang it all the time growing up. Rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. Every burden of my heart rolled away. Oh, it's all gone. It's all gone. No longer there. God's telling Israel that yesterday is forever gone and they are walking, looking to the potential of victory today rather than living in the defeat of yesterday. Our God doesn't work that way of living in the defeat of yesterday. He doesn't work that way. That is the work of, the, uh, of Satan trying to get in there to make you feel useless or guilty, whatever it is. If you made your sin right with the Lord... It's behind the Lord, so just get behind the Lord and sense He's forgotten it. Start serving, doing what's right. Hey, you don't have to worry when you get to heaven, the Lord's going to look at you and say, Now, whoever you are, you did this when you were four years old. No, that, if you got it right with the Lord, He's never going to bring it up again. He don't even remember it anymore. God. God. Don't let the world, the flesh, or devil hold your past over your head. Take the time to contemplate what the Lord has done for you and rejoice. Rejoice. You don't live that way anymore. Of course, if there's sin in your life today, the best thing you could do is get together with the Lord and get that thing taken care of, and victory can be yours. But it can only be yours until your sin is dealt with. Proverbs 28, 13, that he that covers sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So get it right with the Lord. you got to sit in your life, whatever it is. Bring it in, confess it, get it right. The Lord will no longer remember it, and you don't need to remember it either. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. That's what the Lord wants for you. He doesn't want you to live in defeat in the past. The Lord wants to have you victory in your life. Abundant life. Abundant life has nothing to do with defeat of the yesteryear. He wants you to have abundant life today. We must take that a step of celebration. Verses 10, we must take a, a step of concentration, uh, uh, concentration, confirmation, contemplation, and we must take the step of celebration. In verses 10 and 12, these verses we find Israel celebrating the Feast of the pa Passover. They first observed it when they were, at, they were in Egypt, right? Remember that? that uh, and what would take place? But they hadn't done it for like 40 years now. The Passover, when the Lord sent the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn upon Israel, upon Egypt. He told his people to select the lamb and kill it, put its blood on the doorposts and lintels of their house, and to cook and eat that lamb. We find that in Exodus chapter 12. God was going to pass through Egypt that night, and when he did, all the firstborn, the children of the land, would die. And when the Lord passed over Egypt that night, when he saw the Israelites put uh, the blood on their doors, he would pass over those protected homes and the firstborns would, within would live. At that time, Israel was commanded to make a Passover a yearly feast. Do you remember that night when they, the Lord passed over and spared them from death? Do you remember that the Lord had, the blood of the Lamb had saved them? What a picture for us today, the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb. And they were to remember that it was a night which the Lord had delivered them from bondage. Isn't that a great picture for us this morning? For us who have accepted Christ as that lamb's blood has been sold, we're no longer in bondage to sin anymore. 
And we're removed from that. What a great picture for us. The Lord had delivered them. Now they're in a promised land. And they taken care of that circumcision when it was required. And now they're celebrating the feast of the Passover. They were to remember the things that God had done for them. And, and bringing them out of Egypt. And providing for them along the way. What a lesson for us as people of God this morning. For those who know Christ as Savior. As we pass through this life. We must constantly call to mind. Great things the Lord has done for us in the past. Because that's what they were doing this night. On this day. This Passover. We need to remember the times uh, when He's called us in love and saved us by grace and forgave our sins and gave us a victory over enemies and gave us hope when there seemed to be a, a hopeless situation. And you know what? Those situations are innumerable if you would take the time to think of what God has done in your life. They're innumerable. You say, well, Pastor, I have such a hard life. Take some time a day and remember what the Lord has done for you. Because He's done some great and marvelous things. And you know what I find? That when you take time to remember what God has done for you, it strengthens your resolve to face the, face the battles that are before you. Now, I know a pastor that writes down situations in life when he faces trials in the ministry. He writes down how he feels and writes down how the Lord provides. So the next time that same event happens or something similar, he goes back in his journal and says, hey, this is how God did it. This is how God sustained me. Hey, remember what God has done for you. Hey, remember, take some time to celebrate. Spend some time thanking the Lord. Sadly, some people have nothing to remember because they've never been delivered from sin. They've never been saved. And if that's you today, then you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ today. You need to, you need to know him. Just as Israel needed to remember the Lord's commitment to them. Let's look at verse 11. And they did eat of the old corn of the land of the moral after the Passover on leavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Hmm. They remember the Lord's commitment to them. You see, for 40 years they had eaten manna every day. However, when they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan, the manna stopped ceased. Surely Israel was glad the manna was no more. I would think that they ran out of options how to make manna taste better or different or the menu items were pretty limited with just manna. It, would, it sustained them, there's no doubt. While the Passover remained our Passover reminded Israel that God had brought them out of Egypt. The manna was a constant reminder that they had left what they had left behind in Egypt. It was easy for God to bring his people out of Egypt but it was a hot, lot harder for God to get Egypt out of his people, wasn't it? Hey, remember when they first got out? Oh, we remember the onions or the leeks in Egypt and the cucumbers or whatever else. We remember all those things. They forgot about the slavery, <laughs> but they remember the food. They needed to forget the things of Egypt and embrace the things of Canaan. When the manna ceased, they were forced to stop looking back and start looking forward. Start looking around to glean what God had placed before them in the promised land. Far too many Christians still possess an appetite for things in the world. Just like Israel did for the things in Egypt. God help us deliver a, a developing hunger or for a thirst of the inheritance that God has for us. And it's not of the world, it's of the Lord and His things. He saved us so we might learn of Him to enjoy Him and of the things that He had to give us. We shouldn't have to look back to the world or to the wilderness to try to find something that satisfy our hunger. The Lord should satisfy that. His word should be our meat. Rather, we should learn to feed on the things of the Lord and, and, and place our faith and trust in Him. If we'll feed on His word, we'll find places of victory. If we'll look to Him, the world's never going to give us victory. And the appetites of, these, of this world is not going to sustain us to fight the battle. We don't need to be scrounging around for scraps. Hey, we can feast on the Word of God. Hey, you all know I love to eat. That's, that's something you all know by now. And I can remember times growing up, my mom would prepare a huge table of food. Man, the feast was on. It was delicious. You know, and you left that table, you were full. Probably a little bit of gluttony going on there too, but you know what I'm saying. You left full. Then I can remember like a day later, 
And uh, Mrs. Mom's rule that she wouldn't cook nothing else big meal until all the scraps, all the leftovers were taken, all gone. And I can remember a few uh, hostile encounters with my dad as I was trying to get the last piece of chicken or last piece of turkey or whatever it was. It wasn't so much fun when we were scrounging around for scraps. Now, we weren't going hungry, I assure you, but you get the picture. Hey, we don't need to live on the scraps of this old world. We can feast on the Word of God and have that victorious Christian life. Reaching that promised land. If we'll follow Him. If we'll follow Him. With every head bowed and every eye closed. There are some very poignant steps that we looked at this morning. And I hope you'll take them. Hope you won't throw them aside and do your own thing. I would encourage you to follow those steps. You know, this morning, I'm pretty sure, because I know as I did this message, I was convicted about numerous things myself. Maybe some of us need to come before the Lord and remove things from our lives that don't belong there. Things that would hinder our service. Maybe some of us don't have that, but maybe we're not relying upon the Lord and Him alone. Maybe we have our own support group and we leave God out of it until it gets really bad. Now put Him in the first place. Maybe some of us need to release the past. Now you've gotten that sin taken care of. Maybe that situation, whatever it is, you've gotten it, you brought it to the Lord, you asked forgiveness, you can't just let it go. The Lord will give you strength to get over it. He, he loves you. He's forgiven you. I think all of us need to remember the faithfulness of the Lord and His faithfulness to the promises of taking care of us. We need to remember those things. Are you ready to step into that promised land? Are you ready to step into that land of Canaan and see that victorious Christian life? Well, you need to follow these steps. And there's other things you can do as well, but these are great things for us to follow. Dear Jesus, help us this morning. Lord, if we'll be honest with ourselves, that's help us first to be honest with, that we have areas of work. Oh, well, maybe not all these things I listed, but I'm sure there's one or two, maybe one, whatever it is, that we just need to spend some time with you and get those things right. Maybe we're not trusting you as you should. Maybe there is something in our past that keeps nagging us. Lord, help us to get it taken care of. Give us your strength to overcome it. Lord, just be with us. Lord, we want to step out. I really do believe, Lord, that our church wants to step out by faith and do what's right. Lord, help us to follow what we see here in Joshua chapter 5. Lord, I pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. 476, I surrender all.